Genetically modified organisms, GMOs, are used to produce much of the food that we eat. Is it safe? Why are companies doing this? Are we playing God? Here's a short video clip from an opponent of GMOs. Genetically modified organisms, GMOs, pose unparalleled threats. Nothing like them has ever existed in the entire course of life on this planet. If you search the internet for terms genetically modified, you will find these kinds of pictures and articles in abundance. My favorite one is the one showing how your children will become zombies if they eat Monsanto's GM corn. Frankenfish is a movie that uses genetic modification of a catfish as the main part of its plot. However, instead of us eating the fish, the fish eats us. We have an idea about the f what food products contain or do not contain GMOs because trends in U.S. and global agriculture. First, we're going to look at corn production. Here is a plot of the percentage of global acreage devoted to GM corn. And here's in the U.S., Argentina, and South Africa. And in the second graph are acreage in million hectares for GM corn. As you can see, most of the global corn comes from the U.S. And at this point, about 90% of it is genetically modified. Here's the graph for GM soybeans. The big producers are again the U.S. and Argentina and Brazil. And again, here's the graph for millions of hectares planted. The U.S. produces nearly half the world's soybeans, and greater than 90% of it is genetically modified. Here's a graph for GM cotton. The big producers are again are the U.S. and also China and India. And again is the graph for millions of hectares planted. The U.S. produces about a third of the world's cotton, and about 90% of it is genetically modified. Here's the graph for GM canola. The big producer is Canada. Canada produces over 90% of the world's canola, and over 90% of it is genetically modified. The other major GM crop is sugar beets, with about 90% total production being genetically modified. Since half the sugar comes from sugar beets, about half the U.S. sugar supply is genetically modified. Cane sugar is not genetically modified. So, to sum up, in the United States, virtually all products containing corn, soybean, cottonseed, or canola oil are almost always, almost certainly genetically modified. Anything containing corn, including high fructose corn syrup, or soy, is almost certainly genetically modified. It is estimated that about 70% of all U.S. food contains some genetically modified ingredients. The top three opponents of Prop 37, the GMO labeling proposition in California, were Monsanto, DuPont, and Pepsi. Yes, your Pepsi contains high fructose corn syrup from genetically modified corn. <clears throat> now let's look at how genetically modified plants are made. First, a scientist starts with a plant, which is disrupted to produce individual plant cells that can be grown in tissue culture. The scientist then creates a plasmid, a circular piece of DNA that contains the gene of interest along with a gene that confers antibiotic resistance. The plasmid is introduced into plant cells and an antibiotic is added to the tissue culture medium so that only plant cells that have incorporated the transgene, which confers antibiotic resistance, can grow. The tissue culture medium is changed to encourage the plants to differentiate into whole plants. Unlike animal cells, all plant cells are totipotent, meaning that each cell can form an entire plant. After successful differentiation, the new transgenic plant is backcrossed with the original to render it as close as possible to the original breed. To create a transgenic animal, scientists must incorporate the transgene into a fertilized egg cell. Why would scientists want to incorporate foreign genes into crop plants? One reason are these hungry guys. Pests that eat crops can do a tremendous amount of damage and reduce crop yields significantly. For years, farmers sprayed insecticide on crops to prevent pests from eating them. 
One of the most popular insecticides comes from the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt for short, which produces a toxin when it sporulates. When nutritional conditions become poor, the bacterium encloses its DNA in a hard shell, called a spore. At this time, it also produces a toxin. Here's a close-up electron micrograph of the toxin crystals. Scientists discovered early in the 20th century that this toxin kills caterpillars, and farmers have been using it as an insecticide for nearly 100 years. Here's how the Bt toxin works. The toxin, either sprayed on plants or contained within the leaves of GM crops that produce it, is ingested by the caterpillar. The toxin goes down the caterpillar's digestive tract, where it becomes solubilized, then activated. The toxin binds to the mid-gut cells of the caterpillar, forming oligomer. It turns out that the toxin binds to a specific protein found only in the mid-gut of Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. Once the oligomer binds to the membrane, it activates the gut cell's death pathway, which creates pores in the cells, leading to osmotic lysis. When the integrity of the gut is disrupted, the caterpillar dies of septicemia. The second main reason why scientists have created genetically modified crops is to make them resistant to herbicides, which kill weeds. The problem with most herbicides is, there, is that their action is not restricted to killing weeds, but will also kill crops and are somewhat toxic to animals. So farmers had to apply herbicides before planting crops and let those herbicides decay before planting seeds. Alternatively, they could plow all their fields, turning over the weeds and burying them. Both processes cost farmers money, either an additional fuel cost or time lost between plantings. With herbicide-resistant GM crops, farmers can apply herbicides while the crops are growing, preventing the weeds from interfering with the crop or harvest of the plant. Herbicides have varying degrees of toxicity to animals. One of the least toxic to animals is Monsanto's herbicide Roundup. Roundup acts by inhibiting the plant's shikimate pathway. The pathway, partially shown here, produces the aromatic amino acids phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. Roundup, or glyphosate, acts by inhibiting an upstream reaction in the pathway, blocking the production of all three aromatic amino acids. No animals possess the shikimate pathway but instead get all their aromatic amino acids from their diet, the so-called essential amino acids. So Roundup is much less toxic to animals than other herbicides. Now we're going to look at some other transgenic or genetically modified plants. This is a table of most of the genetically modified plants to date. Other than the five main crops mentioned previously, most are not yet grown extensively. There are some unusual plants in this group. One is creeping bent grass, a favorite of golf courses. Now the grass can be grown and sprayed with Roundup to get rid of all the weeds. Several crops have been developed with, with resistance to various viral diseases. Scientists have also engineered oils from plants to be healthier and better tasting than oils from non-GM crops. Scientists have also altered flower pigmentation pathways to create the blue rose and the moonshade carnation. Artist Eduardo Cac wanted to create a flower that was a combination of a plant and an animal. So he employed Dr. Neil Oswowski, University of Minnesota professor of plant biology. Dr. Oswowski attempted to put a transgene from Cac's blood into petunia to give it red veins. However, the idea didn't work. So Cac selected a petunia that already had red veins and had Dr. Oswowski add one of his genes that did nothing so to change the appearance of the flower. However, it seems that Cac's sole purpose was to create shock at his plantimal creation. Now we're going to look at some genetically modified animals. In 1989, genetically engineered salmon was the inspiration for the Frankenfish movie mentioned previously. Aquabounty took an Atlantic salmon, which are already extensively grown in farms, and added a growth hormone regulating gene from a specific Chinook salmon and a promoter gene from an ocean pout. So instead of growing only during the warmer months, 
The aqua advantage salmon grew all year long, achieving maturity in about half the time as a wild Atlantic salmon. This graph shows the growth rate of the aqua advantage salmon compared to the wild salmon. No, the fish does not turn into a giant frankenfish, but reaches full maturity earlier. Here's a picture of two comparably aged salmon. Although these genetically modified salmon could probably outcompete wild salmon because of their high growth rate, they are provided by Aqua Bounty as sterile females to prevent breeding should they be inadvertently released into the wild. Despite these precautions, activist groups along with the Atlantic Salmon Fishing Lobby convinced the FDA not to approve Aqua Bounty's application in 2010. From a scientific perspective, these genes inserted into the genetically modified salmon are naturally occurring and have been eaten in their respective host species without incident. The FDA finally released the environmental report for aqua advantage salmon immediately before Christmas 2012 after the November election, although the report itself was dated to May 2012. So it is likely the aqua advantage salmon will be the first transgenic animal produced for human consumption probably later in this year. Enviropig is a genetically modified pig that produces the enzyme phytase, which allows the pig to digest phytic acid, which contains a form of phosphorus that is normally indigestible to pigs. This results in reduced phosphorus being excreted into the environment, reducing pollution of waterways. Another novel idea in genetic engineering was the cloning of pigs that were rich in omega-3 fatty acids. With this GM pig, you could get your healthy omega-3 fatty acids by eating bacon instead of smelly fish. Genetic engineering has been used to alter cows so that they produce milk that is free of beta-lactoglobulin, which many people are allergic to, and high in casein proteins. Other cows have been genetically modified to produce milk that is nearly identical with human milk, which would allow mothers who cannot nurse the opportunity to give their infants milk that is more natural than standard baby formula. Due to intensive lobbying efforts, none of these GM animals have been approved for human consumption. Fluorescent proteins have been used for years in molecular biology research to report expression of genes to which they're attached. Most of these fluorescent proteins have been isolated from species of jellyfish that glow naturally. Entrepreneurs have incorporated different fluorescent proteins into tropical fish. Here is shown the glowfish electric green tetra. And here are transgenic zebrafish, which have been genetically engineered with different colors of fluorescent proteins. These glowfish have been marketed as, as unique tropical fish, notable for their stunning fluorescent colors. Now we're going to examine the studies that have looked at GM food safety. Here's a short video clip from a GM opponent. Every single independent study conducted on the impact of genetically modified food shows that it damages organs, it causes infertility, it causes immune system failure, it causes holes in the GI tract, it causes multiple organ system failure when it's eaten, it causes a variety of changes, some of which we can't even guess at, as new proteins are coded for by the altered DNA that we've never seen before. We are playing with genetic fire. If genetically modified food were really bad for you, one would expect that the life expectancy in the United States would have decreased during the 17 years since its introduction. However, this graph shows that the life expectancy of both males and females from different races has continued to increase since the introduction of GM crops in 1996. In addition, cancer, cancer deaths have declined about 20% since that time. For a number of GM crops, the genes or gene products never enter the food supply since those parts of the plants are removed during processing. For example, GM sugar from sugar beets is chemically identical to non-GM sugar. Likewise, oils purified from GM canola, soybean, cottonseed, and corn are identical to non-GM oils. Much of the corn crop is dedicated to generating ethanol, 
which of course is identical to non-GM ethanol. Genetically modified cotton is worn rather than ingested, and there have been no reports of adverse effects of wearing GM clothing. For GM crops in which the whole plants are ingested, the genes and gene products are usually destroyed through digestion in the stomach and small intestine. So it is unlikely, even in theory, that eating GM crops can harm human beings. Here's another video clip. There was an eight-year process where all the countries in the world came together and talked about uh, whether there should be safety assessments for genetically engineered crops, uh, genetically engineered animals, and genetically engineered microorganisms. We went to all these meetings over eight years. There's now global agreement that there should be required safety testing for these crops before they come on the market. And you know what? The U.S. does not require that. In the United States, all applications for approval of GMO release for public consumption are handled by the FDA. Development and testing of a new GM crop typically requires 8 to 12 years, including more than 4 years of safety and environmental testing before regulatory approval and commercial release. The so-called frankenfish has been in the loop for over 20 years. <clears throat> No particular food is safe to eat for all human beings. Since about 6% of the human population has allergies to one or more food groups, FDA testing for food allergies to GM foods is identical to similar testing for non-GM foods. Any gene products found in GM food that is not found in non-GM food must have its chemical structure analyzed to determine if it matches any known allergen containing a sequence greater than 35% identical to any 80 amino acid segment of known allergens, where an average protein contains hundreds of amino acids. In nearly all instances, commonly inserted genes would never be expected to be similar to food allergens. However, if a match were found, the protein would have to be tested with sera from allergy sufferers to establish allergenicity. A GM product that exhibits substantial equivalence to the non-GM variety is declared safe to eat. There is no published evidence of allergic reactions to any GM protein or any adverse human health reactions associated with consumption of foods from GM crops since the introduction of GM products into the food supply in 1996. This is a polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis comparison of GMO versus non-GMO soy proteins. The left two lanes show the protein profile of whole soybean extracts from non-GMO left and GMO right soybeans. As you can see, the bands from each lane look identical, showing that they're equivalent amounts of each protein. In the second set of gels, Soy proteins were blotted, then sera from allergic individuals were added to see what proteins were bound, again to the non-GMO on the left and the GMO on the right. Sera from allergic individuals bound to both lanes equally, showing that the allergenicity of GM soy is identical to that of non-GM soy. The right two set of lanes are controls showing the lack of binding to soy from non-allergic sera. The safety of GM foods has been tested in numerous animal studies, including mice, rats, pigs, chickens, and monkeys. Nearly all these studies, the safety of GM foods has been tested in numerous animal studies, including mice, rats, pigs, chickens, and monkeys. Nearly all these studies have shown no differences between the health of animals fed GM versus non-GM diets. Some negative studies have come from one laboratory headed by Dr. Sarah Laney at the University of Caen, France. However, the conclusions of those studies have been refuted by numerous scientists who have noted flaws in study design and statistical evaluation. In addition, Dr. Sarah Laney is funded by the Committee for Research and Independent Information on Genetic Engineering in Paris, France, which opposes genetic engineering of crops. There are a few realistically possible environmental concerns for GM crops. First is the development of resistance to Bt crop target organisms. Resistance to Bt toxin by pests was anticipated prior to commercialization of these crops. 
For this reason, many crops include variations of the Bt toxin in their products. In addition, all farms growing GM Bt crops must plant a small percentage of corresponding non-GM crop in the vicinity. In theory, these non-GM crops would attract pests which would reproduce abundantly, overwhelming the gene pool of any potential Bt resistant mutant pest. So far, the strategy has worked. A second concern is tolerance in weeds to herbicides used in GM crops. Although herbicide resistance has been described, it has not presented a major problem so far. Some of the newer varieties of GM crops are tolerant to multiple herbicides, reducing the likelihood of weeds developing multiple resistances. The third concern was whether eating of pests feeding on GM crops might pose a threat to the predator that eats such pests. Studies have shown few if any impacts on predator species. A fourth question is whether GM traits could be transferred to wild non-GM plants. For example, there are wild relatives of brassica, which includes GM canola, and beta species, which includes GM sugar beets. Although pollen from some species can fertilize other species in the lab, this has never been just demonstrated to have occurred in nature. The main benefit of most GM crops at this point is economics. The economics of GM crops was analyzed in a study of 196 publications containing 721 entries for the statistical analysis in 2011. The meta-analysis found that crop yields for BT cotton were 50% higher than conventional cotton in India. However, yields in developed countries were only 1 to 28% higher since pest management was aggressive before the introduction of GM cotton. However, reductions in pesticide costs range from 16% in the USA to about 70% in China. Yield levels of Bt corn are 5 to 20% higher compared to conventional corn along with lower pesticide costs, which results in a gross higher profit levels of 10 to 17 percent for farmers. For GM soybeans, marginally increased yields and reduced pesticide costs did not make up for the higher cost of GM seed. In general, benefits of GM farming are higher in developed countries compared to industrialized countries. Overall, it is estimated that GM crops benefit farmers by $7 billion per year worldwide. Now we're going to look at some ways GMOs might impact Christianity. <clears throat> there are no dietary restrictions in Christianity other than an admonition against gluttony and eating foods sacrificed to idols. An example would be Colossians 2, 16 through 17, which says, therefore no one to ask is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink. Although Judaism does adhere to a strict dietary code, Orthodox rabbis have ruled that genetically modified food is irrelevant to the Jewish dietary laws. So obviously there's no restriction on eating GMOs by Christians or Jews. Some Christians say that by creating GMOs, scientists are playing God. However, human beings have been breeding plants for thousands of years. Here are two examples. This is a familiar corn plant with large ears of corn. However, corn originally comes from teosinte plant, which produces only a few grains of corn from each ear. These are drawings of yellow and red carrots done in the Flemish botanical book from 1554. These carrots came from wild carrots shown on the right. Since this time, carrots have been bred to be orange and sweet vastly different from the wild variety. These examples show that crops we now grow are quite different from those God originally created. In essence, we've been playing God all along. <clears throat> Besides providing financial benefit, GMOs can produce tangible help to people of third world countries. Vitamin A deficiency kills 670,000 children under the age of five each year. So scientists genetically engineered into rice the beta-carotene gene, which is a precursor of vitamin A, 
On average, serving this rice supplies more than half the daily vitamin A requirement. Since a large percentage of the world's children primarily eat rice, this would be a good way to get them extra vitamin A and prevent childhood deaths. However, Greenpeace and several other environmental organizations have strongly opposed the introduction of any kind of GMOs, even those that might help third world populations. In this article, Greenpeace co-founder Patrick Moore said that Greenpeace should be charged with crimes against humanity for opposing the introduction of golden rice, which could have saved thousands of children from blindness and death each year. Hawaiian papaya was wiped out on the island of Oahu in the 1950s by the um, papaya ring spot virus. So production was moved to the Big Island. However, PRSV infection on the Big Island began in the 1970s and by the early 1990s had destroyed most of the crops. So in 1996, scientists genetically engineered a gene that produced defective viral coat protein and put it into the papaya plant. When PRSV infects the genetically engineered plant, RNA from the defective viral coat gene silences the expression of the real coat gene protein, preventing replication of the virus. However, science did, scientists didn't discover how their defective gene actually worked until many years later. The $60,000 U.S. government project saved the multi-million dollar Hawaiian papaya industry and has provided hundreds of jobs for Hawaiians. Worldwide, there are 300,000 deaths from pesticide poisoning each year. Even in California, there are about 1,200 poisoning each year, although most of them are probably not fatal. Since pest-resistant GMOs can be grown in the absence of pesticides, these deaths and inju injuries could be eliminated through expanded culture of GMO crops. Likewise, GMOs can allow farmers to use less toxic herbicides to control weeds. The result is lower in environmental impact by agriculture. The population of the world ex is expected to rise from the current 7 billion to 9 billion by the year 2050. This rise will require an increase in global crop production by nearly 50 percent. Since most of the arable land is already in use dedicated to agriculture, gains in production will require a significant increase in productivity. In third world countries where most GM population, most populations inc increases will occur, agricultural production is significantly impacted by pests, disease, and weeds. GMOs can dramatically improve productivity under these conditions. Genetic modification of plants holds promise for the future. Plants cannot use nitrogen directly from the atmosphere but require it to be in a chemical form that can be absorbed by the roots. Only certain classes of bacteria can fix nitrogen from the air. Legumes, such as peas and beans, live in symbiosis with these nitrogen-fixing bacteria, providing them with high-energy carbon molecules in exchange for fixed nitrogen. However, through genetic engineering, it would be possible to insert genes involved in nitrogen fixation directly into plants, allowing them to produce their own nitrogen. These crops would require little or no fertilizers, reducing the carbon footprint and environmental impact of fertilizer runoff from farms. In many parts of the world, climate change has resulted in, in reduced rainfall, such as in much of northern and eastern Africa. Drought-resistant crops would markedly increase crop yields in these reg regions contributing to food sustainability. There are a number of other areas where plant disease greatly impacts yields. GMOs engineered for resistance to these diseases when contribute to food sustainability. In general, opponents of GMOs are the same organizations that are environmental advocates or part of the nut nutritional health community. Since environmentalists tend to be on the left side of the political spectrum, Keith Clore of Slate wrote an article saying GMO opponents are the climate skeptics of the left. 
implying that they are ignoring the data and acting irrationally. 42 nations require labeling of food that contains GMO components. These are the countries throughout the world, with most of those countries belonging to the European Union, which dictates the laws of all those countries. In countries where GMO food labeling is required, GMO food products have all but disappeared because stores will not carry GMO products for fear of being unable to sell them, even though surveys show that consumers do not usually read the labels. Now we're going to look at GMOs and the law. <coughs> all genetically modified organisms contain patented DNA technology. The licensing terms require that users of the patents, farmers, not save any seed from previous harvest, but buy licensed seed every year it is planted. Without such licensing restrictions, patents on genetically altered seeds would be useless to protect a company's investment in creating the patent. However, to ensure patent protection, some GM seed companies are now producing seed that when grown does not produce viable embryos preventing the replanting of harvested seed. Some interesting cases of patent infringement have resulted from farmers planting unlicensed GM seed. The most famous case involved Percy Smizer, a canola farmer from Saskatchewan, Canada. The case inspired an extremely biased documentary entitled David vs. Monsanto. Let's look at some excerpts. In 1996, the chemical giant Monsanto introduced its brand of canola into Canada, a brand resistant to the pesticide Roundup. In Schmeisser's region, three farmers agreed to plant Monsanto's new GMO canola. Due to a heavy storm during the harvest, freshly cut GMO canola drifted into Percy Schmeisser's fields. His work of 50 years of breeding was destroyed because his harvest was contaminated by Monsanto's seed. Contamination and destruction of his own breed was irrevocably damaging to Percy Schmeiser. But on top of that, Monsanto turned him, the victim, into a culprit. August 1998, Schmeiser was sued by Monsanto for having illegally planted the corporation's patented GMO canola. And what the trial judge ruled, the first trial judge ruled, is what made the case become internationally known overnight what can happen with farmers when you introduce GMOs. And the judge ruled this. Number one, it does not matter how a farmer is contaminated. The truth is that the facts are not quite the same as those presented in David versus Monsanto. Percy Smizer was found guilty of patent infringement by three courts, including the Canadian Supreme Court. According to Smizer's account, in 1997, he sprayed the herbicide Roundup around some telephone poles at the edge of his farm and discovered that the canola plants had survived, indicating they were GM canola plants. He then sprayed an additional four acres of the adjacent field and found 60% of the plants surviving the spraying. The documentary suggested that the 60% came from wind-blown contamination, which is extremely unlikely. At harvest, Smizer saved the Roundup-resistant seed separately and the following year intentionally planted an additional 1,000 acres out of his 1,400 of land with a saved seed that he knew to be Roundup-resistant. Fortunately for Smizer, he did not use the herbicide Roundup on his crop, so the Canadian Supreme Court voided the lower court's financial judgments. Monsanto had dropped the lawsuit for the 1997 crop even though Smizer's story of accidental contamination was almost certainly false. Monsanto's technology agreement allows farmers to sell their genetically modified crops to commodity markets, which are allowed to sell those seeds as a commodity for anything but planting. So Vernon Bowman, after planting Roundup Ready soybean seed from Monsanto, decided to obtain a second season crop seed from the commodity market saving money on seed costs and avoiding the licensing fee. Since 94% of the soybean market in the U.S. uses Roundup Ready soybeans, the seed from the commodity market was probably nearly pure GM seed. Bowman planted the seed from the commodity market and harvested the seed from that crop and saved it for next season's planting. Then, amazingly, 
Bowman wrote Monsanto, telling him exactly what he had done. Monsanto, of course, sued Bowman since he had violated the terms of the license agreement which prevented the planting of patented seed from previous harvests. Monsanto alleged that Bowman, in planting the seed from the commodity market, had violated the terms of the license agreement. A judge agreed with Monsanto, along with the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The case was um, ultimately decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013, <clears throat> with the court ruling for Monsanto that Bowman had violated the terms of the marketing of the licensing agreement. Here's a video In clip. 2001, a small California biotech company called Epicyte patented a product, patented a gene, which causes both men and women who eat it in the form of any product to produce antibodies to sperm. If the men eat the epicyte gene, they produce antibodies to their own sperm, rendering them irreversibly sterile. If women eat the epicyte gene, when they have intercourse, their bodies produce antibodies to the sperm that has been deposited, and they become infertile through the destruction of the sperm. Now, DuPont and Monsanto formed a joint venture, purchased the Epicyte firm, and, quote, commercialized the Epicyte gene. Do you want to know if the food that you're eating contains the Epicyte gene? The story is immediately suspect, since Monsanto and DuPont are competitors and would be unlikely to do any kind of joint venture. Epicyte Pharmaceuticals developed five patents between 1997 and 2000 related to the ability to produce monoclonal antibodies in plants. None of these patents involved antibodies to sperm. Neither Monsanto nor DuPont ever purchased Epicyte. In fact, Epicyte was purchased by Biolex Therapeutics in 2004. Biolex attempted to produce monoclonal antibodies in the aquatic plant duckweed, not corn. However, they sold their antibody system to Synthon in April 2012 and went bankrupt in July 2012. The Monsanto sterilization gene claim is a ridiculous ho hoax but is widely circulated on the internet. In conclusion, GM crops and food are safe to eat. Genetic engineering technology can make our food more nutritious and contribute to sustainable global agriculture. GM opponents use false and misleading information to thwart development of GM technology. I believe Christians should support research into GM technologies to improve living standards in third world countries. The documentation and study references used in this video can be found at the website godandscience.org. Thank you for your time.